Welcome to the Association for Popular Music Education's Debates in Popular Music Education. I'm Steve, and I'm a performer and educator with over 25 years of experience in popular music education, and I'm also the Vice President of the Association for Popular Music Education. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a musicologist at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom, and I have research publications and an ever-growing interest in authentic music theory. So in this series, we'll serve as your hosts and your guides through some of the hot, some of the controversial, and often the thorny issues around popular music education. And in each episode, we'll have guests who are experts in the field under discussion. We'll discuss, we'll critique, we'll pose questions to each other to kind of get to the nub of our understandings on that subject. And at the close of each of these sessions, we're going to pose a provocation. That's right, a critical or contentious viewpoint from the discussion, which we would like you as vested listeners to give your response. Now, Steve, how are they going to do this? So we're going to encourage you all to respond to this provocation by posting to your social media of choice using the hashtag APME Talkback. Then, a couple of weeks later, Paul and I will seek to address and respond to your posts in a follow-up vlog. We really want this resource to be interactive as we collectively dig into your questions about and around popular music education. So, without further ado, let's begin with this session's hot topic. So today's hot topic, we're going to discuss what does equality, diversity, and inclusion mean for popular music education when focusing on gender? Now, this isn't a new topic. This is something that is grounded in history. We have, from curricula through the ages, been represented by purely white males. So if I take a very small point, and we'll talk about this later on the programme, about theory. We talk about this being the theory, but it's not. It's a theory. It is very much a theory that has been grounded by the people who have written it, or shall I say, had the privilege to be able to be remembered in their history of this. And that then informs the curriculum, and that then informs the learning, and that then informs the representation of where we find ourselves looking back at the musics. And as you'll hear later on in this, we're losing so much by doing that. We are preventing so much thought and we are being really dangerous by excluding people, by thinking historically that that is the set curriculum, that is the canon. Absolutely. And this, the, the topic of gender is, is, is a, it's a charged topic. And, you know, are, what are we, what are we actually talking about? Are we talking about biological sex? Are we talking about representative gender? Or in terms of Judith Butler, are we talking more about performative gender? So that's something to kind of think about as we go through these, um, go through this conversation of the of these binaries of male and female mm -hmm. and the fluidity that we're beginning to come to a better understanding of. When we talk about gender in, say, the music industry, all of these uh, statistics I'm going to mention come from an article or a study, rather, by Stacy Smith and the University of Southern California Annenberg Inclusion Initiative. It's called Inclusion in the Recording Studio, and I'll have that link down below. But Paul's spoken and talked about the past, but where are we now? Mm -hmm. You know, haven't we gotten mm -hmm. better? Well, based on the 2020 Billboard Hot 100, women were 21.6% of all artists. 12.6% of the songwriters and only 2.6% of the producers were identified as female. For the 2021 Grammy Awards, 21, sorry, 28% of all nominees in, in five categories um, were women. And if we look at the 26 most prominent major labels in the US and the UK, which are owned by Universal, Sony, and Warner, we see that female executives run or co-run just four of them. And then making that switch over to education, it's like, well, certainly education is different, right? Well, not so much. So when we're looking at recent college graduates with a degree in music, we find that uh, that 60% are female, 40% are male. When, um, when Ken Elpis took a look at teaching license candidates in music, he found a very similar split. And if we look at studies that examine college graduates overall, primarily in the US, studies show a similar split being 60% 40, sorry, 60% female, 40% male. 
And what's interesting is that's a complete flip from the 1960s. So and if we continue on there, take a look at the roles that we play in terms of who is teaching. If we look at the gender and music education in the US, the vast majority of high school band directors are male, 80%. Mm -hmm. Reciprocally, if we take a look at K through eight music teachers, they are 78% female. So we have this vast imbalance between secondary and elementary, and that extends on into college. When we take a look at studies that say only 11% of all college band director positions in the United States are currently held by women. So going back to our question, what Paul was asking earlier, is the music industry a reflection of society? Is music education, and further, is music education a reflection of the music industry? And what we hope is that from what you're about to listen to, you take ideas, thoughts, things, seeds that can be planted into the mm. minds of the people that you work with and that you, you educate as well, so that we can start to change some of those really quite stark statistics that Steve has just mentioned. Absolutely. And with that, let's dive into the, into the conversation. So for today's hot topic, the question we're going to focus on is what does equality, diversity, and inclusion mean for pop and music education when focusing primarily on gender? And so we're joined by three people here who have an absolute vested interest in this and have people who have written about this topic. And it's really important that we, I think we hear these voices. So I've got the pleasure of introducing Vic, who I've known since I was a teenager. And we'll not see how long that was, shall we? No, we won't. So Vic, tell us about yourself. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Paul. Yes, we've known each other a, a very long time. After graduating from my degree, I've spent most of that 25 years working in the music industry, various parts of the music industry. And now I'm a full-time campaigner, researcher, consultant, mainly to do with women and music, but I, I, I do take an intersectional approach mm. as, as well. But yeah, that's my full-time job now. And for our other guests, we have Dr. Vincent Andrasani and also Dr. Margaret McCauley. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Paul, for having us. You want to go ahead? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Margaret McCauley. I'm a researcher at the Global Strategy Lab at the University of Ottawa, um, where I I'm currently doing something separate to sort of gender uh, and digital media. I study the role of the chief medical officer in the context of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, before that, um, I did a postdoc at the University of British Columbia, where I studied um, sexual violence among uh, sexual and gender minority youth. Mm -hmm. um, and I did uh, a PhD at uh, Simon Fraser University, where I looked at um, online dating apps and HIV prevention among gay men. Um, and so I sort of bring a, a long-standing interest in gender mm. and sexuality and the way that they um, intersect and mediate with new media platforms. And I'm a, a currently a teaching professor at uh, Carleton University. Um, I, uh, I study sound, so I'm a sound studies scholar. Um, I've arrived at sound studies by way of music studies. So. Uh, in my past, I've done a little bit of research in the area of music, in particular Afro-Cuban music. Uh, my research is uh, is based, was based largely in uh, the city of Havana, Cuba, um, where I was interested initially in the musical culture, but then in terms of urban soundscapes more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and I bring to this my background as a performing musician. So I uh, spent mm -hmm. a number of years before doing my PhD performing. I'm a drummer. Uh, I've been playing drums since I was a kid. I taught drums for many years. And that was my life before I uh, before I started my PhD. I was uh, teaching and playing, uh, teaching thirty students a week and playing uh, eight or nine gigs a month. So, and here I am. That's great. Thank you also very much. So, with that, Paul, let's jump into the first question. I think we should, and let's go really big and difficult straight away. So, let, let's start with the side. Music history remains. And I'm not going to say largely, I'm just going to say remains taught from an overtly male perspective. We think of the canon, we think of your Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. These are things that are set in the curricula. And then there's the, there's the additional list of 
proposals that we have yet. Now, how do we change that? How do we change that horrible balance so that we actually get something that is representative and actually kind of gets to the point where we don't need the extra list? There isn't this supplementary list of female composers. How do we, how do, how do, we do that? What are your thoughts? Sure, I've got, I've certainly got my, my, my <laughs> thoughts about this. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Paul, you know, thinking, thinking about when we studied music together, mm -hmm. and um, which we did a, a HND, which was sort of pre, right. pre, pre degree, and it was classically music focused. I don't think in that two year program, well, I can't remember learning or doing any, any research on a female composer and Same. and and in in fact I, you know during that time it didn't even occur to me I didn't even know mm. that there were female composers mm -hmm. around and we had we had female tutors and and male tutors and I really I, I loved the course I loved I loved what we were doing mm. there certainly wasn't any 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 women involved so it really has to be part of the the curriculum it has to be ingrained, and, and as you say, not an additional. Or maybe we'll, you know, you can have a, um, you know, a special, a special additional mm -hmm. project looking at, at, at female composers. They just have to become part of that canon, don't they? So I think mm -hmm. I think it was in the mid the mid noughties when I started working with contemporary songwriters and composers. I met my first female composer, mm -hmm. an, an incredible woman called Evelyn Wallen. Mm. Uh, who is one of the UK's top top female composers? I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe mm. it. I was like, "What? There are women who yeah. who who compose." So it you know it has to filter through into university education and and, and down as uh, as well to to pre pre university. It just has to be part part of it. I absolutely agree, and I similarly can't remember discussing. A composer, not even the standard pullout of Fanny Mendelssohn, who happens to just be Mendelssohn's sister. You know, it, you, you couldn't even have that person associated by themselves. They had to be linked to somebody. You know, absolutely true. And it wasn't something that was in the canon at all. It wasn't something that had come through any of my prior education. Vincent, Margaret, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question, and I'd probably be. I mean, um, I'd probably be inclined to answer it in by thinking about it in, in a couple of different ways. One of which is if we think about it in terms of, okay, so what's happening in the world of music? Like what's happening in the world of musical composition and musical performance? What's happening in from our sort of vantage point as maybe uh, folks who are working in academia? So what's happening in the world of music? What's happening in the mm. musical on the scene, right? Is one sort of way. But then the other sort of level is like, okay, so what are we doing in the classroom? Like, what are we doing as educators to change this conversation, right? So on the one hand, we have this performance composition sort of uh, dimension to it. But on the other hand, there's like, okay, well, what happens when we close the door in our classroom and speak to our students about these sorts of things, right? So these are the two levels. And the first level, um, I think that there's, a, there's, there's the need to recognize and acknowledge. On the, so we have to kind of straddle this line and I think there's a good example and Margaret and I were chatting about just yesterday we'll, we'll mm -hmm. bring up in just a second so on the one hand we want to um, acknowledge the sort of social locations and the identities of the performers who the performers and the composers themselves right we want to understand sort of the social context from which they're coming to us um, but on the other hand we also want to see this as a legitimate contribution to these broader musical dialogues that are just happening in general mm -hmm. right music mm -hmm. music the, the music is music sort of thing right mm -hmm. so how do we kind of work between these how do we straddle this line so to speak while acknowledging difference but also acknowledging contributions to broader discussions well one way of answering this i think um, um astutely is by thinking about the history of sort of jazz music it's like Margaret brought this up yesterday. If you want, you can talk, speak to this. Uh, edit this part. Of, I think you'd be better. Okay. Position. Well, I mean, <laughs> so okay. So, Sorry. so the idea that the idea of jazz. I mean, it's like if we're talking about jazz in a way that doesn't acknowledge the the sort of the history of racism in America, then we're not actually mm. talking about jazz, 
right? We're talking about something else. So, so, so the, the example is, is like, okay, so how then do we acknowledge musical contributions, but also discuss it in terms of its, um, its, its sort of social, the social milieu that it comes from? Okay, so that's one, that's one level that I would be inclined to think of this from. The other level is like, what happens when we close the door as music educators? Right. That's that's mm -hmm. that's 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 the second dimension, and I think that's very important. Um, and and this brings up the question, as someone who's you know a teaching a teaching professor, I think about the, these sorts of things a lot. It brings up the question of um, what we teach versus how we teach it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think I think I think the, I think the difference is subtle, but it's absolutely crucial. Right, because I, I don't think I don't think that music is the only discipline that music popular music education, for instance, is the only discipline that's actually revisiting revisiting their canon, saying, um, "Okay, hold on here." You know, like I I can I can tell you for certain that you know we're we're asking the same questions in media studies. Um, people are asking the same question in sound studies. Like, what do we do with Murray Schaefer? What do we do with uh, what do we do with Marshall McLuhan? These are you know problematic figures that are very much, they compose the center of the, the, the field of study for they, and they've done mm -hmm. for so long. So what do we do? Do we throw out the baby with the bathwater? I don't think so, right? I think we have to figure out new ways of talking about who they are in the time that they wrote what they wrote. For instance, mm -hmm. how do we teach, how do we teach uh, culture industries without talking about Adorno? Mm -hmm. I mean, can, can we get rid of Adorno? I, I mean, in my Wait, humble opinion, well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> potentially. I, you, you, and every student I've taught, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. It's like, uh, and the it's reason I'd like to get rid of him is when he's associated with popular music, the the the, the, the hundred years difference isn't connected by the student. Yeah, but I've exactly. been flippant, Proof. but to kind of prove a point mm -hmm. that when we talk about a person, you are saying it's in context. Mm. In that sort and, of, yes, I get you. And this is it, right? So on the one hand, and so we can't teach Adorno without teaching Adorno the person. On the one hand, you have yeah. to teach that he's, you know, he was Jewish and he was he lived under a Nazi regime and he and he moved to England, then he moved to Santa Monica, and he was and he faced this 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 very real um potential threat of being persecuted on account of mm. his identity. Also, he belonged to a fraternity of mm. other men. Who were the only ones who spoke about you know what culture industries were and they they were the mm -hmm. so you know like there's the, without talking about that we're not like my 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 fear is my fear is throwing the baby without with the bath what's the saying throw the baby out with the bath water mm -hmm. but That's actually it. it's incumbent upon us to figure out new ways of uh presenting that baby in the bath water let's say mm -hmm. so <laughs> margaret thoughts I like to be honest I mean I'm not a music I'm not a music mm. scholar or person so I I don't have as much to say about that but um I guess something I could think about would be um you know who we you know who we choose to include and exclude uh is important mm -hmm. um uh, and I think it by itself is a political choice so I would say for music education one way to think about it would be to contextualize it in the way that Vincent talked about which is um, that when you include someone in this um, curriculum or in this program, you explain why, right? Why they're there, why not others? And I think it, another good way to sort of, you know, address this is also to kind of, you know, present who some of the historical figures of this canon are, but also to present the contemporaries that are mm, there and yeah. to contextualize yeah. them in response to it so that we can learn about some of these important contributors by looking at contemporary artists who have you know taken their tradition but made it into something new mm, you know so yeah. that we can make the connection yeah. between the the present past and future i think that's absolutely a interesting point one thing i was going to pick up there was um the, the book that I just got out there, which is Music's at the Turn of the 20th Century, I asked people to contribute to this. And we were talking about metatonal musics. And I, and I said to them all, please, 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 overtly include female composers, almost to the limit of, if you've got a choice, bin the male composer. Hmm. Because I wanted it to show that balance of Amy Beach and Rebecca Clark rather than just, oh, well, I'll just do my, go to my standard canon. And interesting, what you're saying there is, I've, I, I was teaching this morning, and we were doing a chap called Thomas Campion in music theory. And I said, this is a person who is unbelievably privileged, a white male, 
And the reason we're teaching about this theory is because he had the privilege to exist. That's not to say that there weren't other theories, but this is a theory, not the theory of it. So it's, what you're saying there really resonates well there. Absolutely. And thinking back to my experiences as a music major, um, really from from the beginning in music history, it's like, OK, we're going to we're going to mention Hildegard von Bingen because because mm -hmm. she is mm -hmm. she's the, the landmark. And then we're going to wait another couple hundred years. Then we're going to mention, you know, Claire Schumann. And then mm -hmm. we're going to not mention anyone else. You know, we, we yeah. will probably listen to a recording of Anonymous Four. Um, you mm -hmm. know, which, which which is for women. But other than that, that in in terms of my experience in Western theory and Western history, that was it. And even as as a jazz and classical major in the jazz world, um, you know, whenever we talked about about females, it was it was Ella, it was Billy, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. Sarah, it was Diane, it was always the female vocalist, never Melba Liston or anyone else like that. It wasn't any. So it's interesting getting into these this idea of role models if you don't see yourself in the curriculum if you don't see yes. yourself at you know in terms of the, the the roles that you encounter every day then how how much more difficult is it for you to envision yourself to see yourself in that role on down the line if you think oh well i guess there are no female drummers i guess i, I have to i have to choose something else and that wraps us into this the second question in well, terms I of think this margaret's going to jump in oh please yeah. Margaret, go ahead Thanks, thanks. Uh, I was just going to say too, I think it's, it's not only important from the perspective of, you know, underrepresented and marginalized students, but also even students that belong to the dominant group. So, mm. you know, you talked earlier mm. about, you know, how you teach the positionality of the location of some of these more privileged um, actors, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. to train students from dominant groups to understand that they uh, are in this privileged position at the expense um, of, of other creators is important so that we train um, we train everybody to think uh, to, to look at sort of uh, the majority and the minority voices that are represented. So it's mm. not only um, minority groups that are advocating for themselves, which is great, but for all of us to, to sort of you know examine our own um, privilege uh, in relation to you know the production of music, for example. No super yeah. interesting point. And what we've got from this is that the balance, that there is there, this imbalance. I mean, Vic, I'm, I'm struck by your point because yes, when we did our HND together, it just wasn't even mentioned. But you see, if we've gone further in our educational history, further down the chain into our O levels or even our primary school education, we would have got to the HND and gone, where have they all gone? And actually, we're, we're always very common to blame the plumber that put in the previous boiler. Well, actually, we've got to start being the ones that keep going down and keep going down and being the advocates to say, no, it is time that we raise these profiles. Absolutely. And it's this, it's this idea of this imbalance of folks who have been marginalized, folks who have been othered, um, because we from the dominant group have, frankly, othered them. So it's this idea of what are the, and that brings us to the second question, is what are the consequences of this imbalance in terms of music education. And I'm even going to say, what are the consequences of this imbalance in terms of, of education and mm -hmm. also in terms of music education, music industry, and our society at large? Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I can jump in, I, I, really, I really feel that, um, well, it's what I call a thousand years of musical patriarchy has mm -hmm. its, has its direct impact on the on the on the on music education not not just in terms of the of the of the music that is learned while you go while you're going through that process but also who is teaching so i do i do know that um conservatoires and higher education in the uk it's very very dominated by by male tutors male lecturers and that replicates Mm -hmm. Because that's that's the role models, and certainly in certain in instruments where instruments are gendered. Yes. So, drums and percussion mm -hmm. and brass instruments are um, are very very gendered, and I think in in orchestras it's sort of ninety over ninety ninety percent of of orchestras certainly in the UK 
are played by men and then you get other other instruments which are now female gendered such as flutes mm -hmm. and the really delicate um uh, instruments mm -hmm. interestingly enough uh, um uh, violins used to be male it's then now becoming more female so that's sort of trans mm -hmm. transitioning <laughs> but those those um um uh, yeah, role role models and then per, pers persistence through education has a has a real impact through the through the rest of the music industry, and it becomes becomes very difficult to to change unless we're unless we're very self aware of those of the processes which are happening in music education, and I think music technology as well is mm. another another area which is 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 very dominated by by men, and there's all there's all sorts of barriers and problems around music music technology not least the um the atmosphere of those of those courses so i've spoken to i was just in an event earlier today speaking to to women who had who were, were moving into music production uh, and talking about their experiences in the classroom where they they were usually the the only female in that mm -hmm. in, environment, and it was, uh, you know, it was it sounded sounded very difficult, very very negative. There was a real culture of um, of of you know young men together who were who were clubbing together and being and being quite discriminatory towards towards any young women who were attempting mm -hmm. to to break into into that sector. So there's lots there's lots of barriers for for for, for women change changing these statistics. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You talk about the word persistence, and that's such a powerful word, isn't it? Within the thousand years of the patriarchy, you know, there's this persistence that it just keeps fulfilling itself. Why right? it comes through? I'm minded of the degree program that I took over uh, yonks ago, and it was a music technology program, and it was full of men. Mm -hmm. And you know, my first role within it was to change that, and all I did was change the marketing. I took a. I, I asked Ivy. Do you mind if I take a picture of you at the desk? And she went, no, I'm busy. Bugger off. You know, no. do you mind if I take a picture? And this is the reason why. Oh, okay, fair enough. Within the, there's the second recruitment cycle, I had a gender balance because that very simple thing of, oh, I look like that and I like doing that. Therefore, they're a gatekeeper to allow me to do that. Really, really simple things to break those. those but I'm, I'm struck by the word persistence. Um, yeah, I think what you said, yeah, that's a that's a really powerful example. Um, you know, in order to be able to, you know, to feel confident and to feel supported, uh, you need to see yourself represented in some way. Like mm. it's a minimum precondition. It's not, I don't think it should be the end, of course, but it, it is a beginning that is very important. Um, and I would also say that, you know, in terms of this imbalance, um, whether it's the visibility or in the teaching, um, it does a disservice to students if we don't make an effort to sort of modernize and create more inclusive curricula because then they're not understanding the totality of music, mm. right? You're, mm. you're only understanding it from one perspective. And, you know, from a creativity perspective, that's, uh, that's a bad thing, right? We need to be ex <laughs> exposed to as much as possible. Um, so, yeah, so... You know, and I'm thinking about Vic, the example that you you give of of the women that enter these programs and they just feel horribly, you know, discriminated mm. against. And it's mm. it's because it, it becomes so normalized, not only in what we see in the classroom, what we see in music, what we see in society. So this requires change at multiple levels. But, you know, um, the idea is that in the classroom becomes one important uh, site of change. And I think, you know, you bring up this example of, you know, asking um, this woman to, you know, become a representative for this program, right? So this is a change that you <laughs> made it was a small modest change and it's important yeah and in the context of uh, i can think about this in the context of syllabus design uh in a mm -hmm. pop music course that i delivered just a couple of years ago at simon fraser university i mean it's a really difficult thing to come up with a pop music syllabus and not include so many of the voices that are mm -hmm. that we see and we hear in pop music and for students Students love the course. Well, I mean, it was delivered in the communication studies program. So it was part of, you know, cultural communication uh, mm -hmm. approaches, right? Um, so they they love they love the the this course because it's about music. But also, mm -hmm. so that that was like I, I had won them over mm -hmm. the first day they yeah. kind of, they came into class, <laughs> right? So, but at the same time, um, you win them over again because 
you because they see themselves in your syllabus because they see themselves in yes. because they have favorite artists right mm -hmm. <laughs> and their mm -hmm. favorite mm -hmm. and they see themselves in their favorite artists and so just like picking up on what margaret just says um the classroom is itself a political site right it's a site mm -hmm. and it is yes. a site for political change um and and you know a lot of the comments that i receive on that class were from students who for the first time saw themselves in a syllabus design wow Right. Wow. So, so that's that's a that's an. I mean, you know, music is a site of social change, right? That's there. There's yeah, absolutely. There's something to it there, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, so what we're coming around to at uh, this sort of midpoint in the thoughts is, say you're listening to this and you're trying to say, well, okay, it's, it's it's a good chat and it's a worthy chat, but what can I actually do? What can I actually take from it? I'm going to invite you all right now just to give me one thing you think as an educator you could do. I'm going to give you mine, which is just be honest about the history of this. Just be honest when you're teaching that it comes from a dominant white male perspective. Go on, Vic. What would be the one thing you would give that educator? Just one. I, I give statistics. Mm -hmm. I show, you know, I do, and I show, I show students, some of whom might be very skeptical. I haven't, you know, mm. haven't, haven't really thought about it. I give them, I give them statistics of where we are right now. Yeah, that's good, Margaret. Yeah. I would say, uh, be prepared for resistance and how yeah. to navigate that in the classroom because. Um, although it would be nice to have an expectation that all of our students would would come with the same level of knowledge and the same level of experience, mm. that's not the case. And so as educators, we have this responsibility mm. to guide students. And that can be quite difficult if, um, you know, we feel, uh, you know, frustrated or if, mm -hmm. you know, we are, you know, we experience the, the kind of discrimination that we're talking about and people are not on board. So um, I, I would say that that is a really big part of it. No, that's fine. Vincent. Um, rather than give them something, I might invite them to something. And I would invite mm -hmm. them to, I would invite them to think about, um, in our case, in the case of this discussion music, but I would invite mm -hmm. them in the case of any classroom at any time, anywhere, I would invite them to think about the world from a perspective that's not their own. Mm, I would invite them good. to think about the world from mm. the perspective of someone else. And mm. I think that's that's one of the key linchpins, let's say, of education mm. is, is understanding who you are in the world. It's understanding who you are as a citizen of, of the university, of the city, of the mm -hmm. our case province, of the country, of the world. And I think yeah. invite and the only way to cultivate citizens, or the, I think maybe one of uh, uh, an important way to, cult to cultivate citizens, is to get people to acknowledge that there are other people who inhabit society as well. <laughs> that, that's a super good point, Steve. Yeah, you're not it, getting out of this. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting because I'm going to. I'm not going, I'm, I'm going, there's a little bit of tension between, between what you mentioned, Paul, was that here in the mm -hmm. United States, um, there are, there are laws that are on the books now recently and laws mm -hmm. that are coming in the state legislatures that say mm -hmm. you can't make a child feel any discomfort around mm -hmm. their gender or their race or their mm -hmm. ethnicity. There's a new law that's coming across the way in Florida that says you cannot talk about any other genders or bi biographical, biological sexes um, other than male and female. So it's you have these, these, uh, these, these politicians are trying to, uh, they are, well, no, no, they're not are, they're trying to erase people through legislation, less legislation. And it's, it's mm -hmm. certainly discomforting to see. And in some states, honestly, I would love to go in and present statistics. But if that makes mm -hmm. a child, you know, or invite yeah. a, uh, someone to think about what about the students? What about your neighbors? What about the students sitting beside mm -hmm. you? What are the similarities? What are the differences in your culture? But I, as I said, in a lot of places here in, in the states, um, I would be breaking the law. In some states, there mm -hmm. are um, there are hotlines set up to where if a child goes home and says mom guess what mr holly said today that 
child's parent can call this hotline anonymously and rat me out. And not only will I lose my job, but the school district could lose a substantial amount of funding. So that's, I, I kind of see the look on Vic's face like, what? And it's just, it's, it's insane. But so it's, but how do you find, how do you find that balance in the vast imbalance of all this to where, okay, this is important for students to know. This is important for students to be those good citizens of the world. Mm. But how do you get that information across, across how do you be an ally? How can you be a co-conspirator in this? Mm. Um, and at the same time, keep your position so you can continue to be that co-conspirator in this as well. So I know I didn't really give something yeah. in terms of like, here's no, what no, you no, should that's... do. But it's here. Are the, here are some of the things that we're There's the framing. wrestling with. There's the framing, and it's super Truly. interesting. When he first started talking, I was like, "Oh, there's laws. Oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be protecting. This is going to be supporting." And very quickly, as oh, you started no. speaking, I thought, "Oh my goodness, that's the other way around." And I think anybody watching this will see all of our faces. So, really, and you know that moment of disbelief. So, how do you read against the politics? How do you read against the stupidity? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to hold myself and I can feel a rant coming on. And as many of you will know, if I, the rant comes on, we've had it, we may as well just close the podcast. So <laughs> how do we do that? How do we actually do that? And, you know, Vic, Margaret, Vincent, you've all been active and made use of social media. And I use that term really in its most larger sense. So can we, can we dive into that idea of the social media, how it can help, how it can draw out prejudice and serve as a positive platform? Because there's many indications where social media is seen as a negative. It's seen as a trolling or a keyboard warrior. And, and actually it, it, it has the, the flip of it as well. And in what Steve just said, which a lot of us are still trying to process here, how does that act as a counter? Who wants to jump in with this thought of how social media can work to the favour? Well, I, I set up a not-for-profit organisation nearly two years ago off the back of one tweet. So oh. I, you know, I, I, I think Twitter's, Twitter's the, the platform where I'm most active. Um, I have experienced trolling, but hey, you just you just block them and and and, and mm, manage it. Mm, mm. Uh, over overall, you know, I've I've made good friends, good friends, mm -hmm. come across really interesting academic research and um, mm -hmm. your paper papers and 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 books and references that I would never have come across without without having having seen Twitter mm. because I follow lots of academics. And also, um, in the first few months of the lockdown, two, two years ago, mm, mm. I was um, really thinking about setting up a not-for-profit organisation aimed at um, looking after female musicians, mm. supporting, supporting female musicians, because all of the research I'd done showed such, such an equality, I really wanted mm. to do something mm. about that. So I just made one tweet and said, um, I'm thinking about doing this. Is anybody interested in, in helping me? Thinking I'd have five or six responses. And I had 120 mm. responses of people saying, oh, that sounds great. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. So it's it's it snowballed. And, and now I've got um, a, a community interest company, a social enterprise, and we have a board of 12, 12 women from all across the UK, from all different parts of the music industry. I've got 80 social media ambassadors, some men, mainly women. And, uh, and again, from, from every, every part of the, the, the music industry. And I've got a, a lot online directory of over 5,000 female musicians. Uh, we do mm. loads of work. So that is the amazing thing about social media. Cool. You know, yes, it does have this this dark under, under, underbelly, or, you mm. know, of really, mm. of really uh, nasty behavior, but you can put in uh, protections, I think, um, as long as you're not too high profile. <laughs> and, um, and, off, and off you go. So I've met my tribe on Twitter, which is that intersection yeah. between, between mu music and feminism. <laughs> Vic, that's great. That's a excellent. That's a really heartening sort of account of uh, of the benefits of um, of social media. Social media is, I think, it's really interesting because 
Um, uh, social media is is where most of music lives today, right? Mm. Like most of, and I think I think uh, most of the music performed and created today finds its way to social to social media in some way, shape, or form. Mm. And all of this has been completely exacerbated by the pandemic, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. So so like more people than ever before were doing music online in ways that they weren't doing music online before March of March 2020, right? Um, so so if, if we want to learn what's happening in the world of music, well, then being on social media is almost a precondition. If you're a musician and you're looking for gigs, unless you're like, you know, um, uh, Cindy Blackman, who's going to get a gig anyway, or Terry Lynn Carrington, who's going to get mm -hmm. a gig anyway, um, you should probably be on social media, right? Um, and so it's the place, it's a place where all the politics of everything that we've been talking about that gets played out, right? So for women, as Vic mentions, rightly mentions, it's, it's a place, it's a place to connect, it's a place to build community, because it's otherwise difficult to do in real life. During the pandemic, it's impossible mm -hmm. to do in real life. Um, it's a place for advertising, social media is. Um, it's a space, it's a space where, you know, um, otherwise maybe marginalized I musical identities could have the opportunity to connect. So, and there are so many artists, like there's so many female, like our, our interest is in female drummers. And there are so mm -hmm. many, uh, female drummers who have gained like substantial followings, um, as a result of, and which have really made their career. I mean, I could think of, uh, Annika Niles from mm -hmm. Germany. I can think of Sarah Thauer from Toronto, mm -hmm. where where I'm from, um, who has now, the last I checked, she had 250,000 people following her on, oh. on Instagram, which is like, you can find, you know, the biggest, Dave Weckl doesn't have, you know, Vinnie Kaliuta doesn't have <laughs> 250,000 people following him. So, so these people like they're, they're, they've, they've had the opportunity to, to connect and, and they've become visible um, and very successful as a result of social media. But um, as Vic mm. mentions rightly, there is a sort of other side to that visibility. Um, and I think Margaret can speak to that uh, quite, quite well. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, um, we wrote a chapter in the uh, Cambridge Companion for the drum kit, um, and we did this analysis mm -hmm. of comments um, left on um, Instagram accounts uh, like female drummers, Tom Tom Magazine, and Hit Like a Girl. And so we studied this and so we read comments a lot. And we found by and large, the comments in this space were mainly positive. It was it was really great to see it. But of course there is a cost and there is a downside. So, you know, by making um, women, non-binary, trans, gender non-conforming artists more mm -hmm. visible, you also become more vulnerable to, you know, critique and scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you would, uh, for all of the comments and support, you'd occasionally see things like, you know, along the lines of, oh, she's pretty good for a girl or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So, you know, we would see that anybody who wasn't coded as, you know, a, a cisgendered male was sort of um, seen as inferior or women would be compared to each other, right? That they would be ranked mm -hmm. in this way, like this imposition of, of a competitive spirit, which really went against the ethos of these online communities, which was about a lot of solidarity um, and support. So, you know, we would see artists, um, you know, get scrutinized in this way. But what we really found the the sort of, marker of whether or not you had received this criticism would be of how politically charged your comment or your post would be. So if it was a relatively, if it was seen as a relatively benign post, if it was just somebody that posted a video of themselves saying, hey, I'm playing these drums, you know, it'd be like by and large positive. But if you would have an artist who would critique uh, the gender politics of the music industry themselves in their post, then that's when you would get the backlash, right? So this is very similar to this communication media studies scholar, Sarah Benet Weiser's idea of a popular feminism, which tends to be mm -hmm. circulated the most um, mm -hmm. online and in popular culture, which is that feminism is okay when it's seen as benign, when it's seen as, you know, an individual choice, a performance that doesn't threaten the status quo um, when the politics are soft and muted. But as soon as there's a sharp critique issued, that's when the backlash comes. So artists who are in these spaces have to very carefully negotiate this uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. That saddens me, but also fascinating. Mm -hmm. Just, but, and and mm -hmm. it, frankly, not surprising that, you know, who, who, who does this woman, who does this girl think she is? Mm -hmm. 
Just that, yes. that, that, that mm -hmm. once again, going back to those biases and assumptions and uh, yeah, that that's just troubling. I, I, that said, it's interesting that I, I wonder how social media can act as, as a lifeline to some of these folks who mm -hmm. can say, well, I don't see myself in my space, but I do see myself in this space where I can go mm -hmm. out and I can mm -hmm. follow, like you said, a Cindy Blackman, or I can follow some or a Terry Lane Carrington or a Tia Fuller or whoever else is out there. And they're not the one-offs. They're, you know, they might be the exception now, but they're becoming more the rule that we see. So I, I guess one thing I would ask is, what are, some, what are some folks out there that you would suggest in terms of lifelines? If, if you if someone were to say, I don't see myself in the curriculum, I don't see myself mm -hmm. on the stage, I don't see myself in, in, in my program, who are some folks that you would um, that you would suggest on social media mm -hmm. that you would um, that you would suggest folks take a look at following? Uh, well, I would say, I'd say my organization. Yeah. The, the, the <laughs> okay. Yes. The list for me Fair is game. Like... <laughs> yes. <laughs> But we also, we also signpost to what we call sister organizations on, mm -hmm. on our website. And at the minute, I think we've got about 60 sister organizations. These are campaigns, initiatives, projects, charities, mainly looking at gender diversity, but also a, a, you know, a, little, a little bit of maybe um, a couple of projects looking at disabled musicians, supporting disabled musicians, or black ethnic minority musicians and so on. So it's all music, music focused, but yeah, lots and lots. And I wanna give a particular shout out to a woman called Gabriella Dilaccio, who runs an organization called Donna UK. And she campaigns for greater representation for female classical artists mm -hmm. and composers. Mm -hmm. And so Donna UK is a really fantastic resource as well. And don't worry if you didn't catch these, because they are in our links in the, at the bottom of this as well. But flist. flistmusic.uk. So I'm afraid it, it is focused on UK musicians because I couldn't cover the world on, uh, on my own. <laughs> but there are not different... Yet. Not yet. There are, I've helped um, women in other countries set up, set up uh, mm. di directories, so women in, in Ireland. And there were other directories, um, uh, uh, female, pressure, you, uh, female Pressure looks after electronic female artists. And yeah, there's this, oh, this just so many amazing initiatives out there. Fascinating. Margaret or Vincent, what's, what's your go-to follow? I, I guess I would plug Terry Lynn Carrington. You know, not only mm. is she an amazing performer, but she's got so many initiatives going. She's got the Jazz Gender Justice Initiative mm -hmm. at Berkeley School of Music. Um, I think there's a next generation jazz initiative she just started um, for, you know, for underrepresented uh, composers across um, gender and racial um, identities. Um, so I would give my, my shout out to her her because it's a these are all you know um examples of people that are making a difference in these spaces and inspiring mm. the next generation um i would say <clears throat> i would say uh, a couple of individuals who are i think are are amazing to follow not because they're women but because they're amazing like they're just they're mm -hmm. unbelievable performers and i'm thinking of sarah thauer madden class annika niles these are the best drummers today like hands down. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would think about those three, but I also think about like, like TomTom Tom Magazine as mm -hmm. a sort of community hub. Uh, TomTom Tom Magazine is a quarterly, it's a quarterly publication. So um, it's it's released four times a year. It doesn't have the traction quite as much as, as mo like a modern drummer would, which yeah. has a monthly, a monthly and, and also a mm -hmm. subs subscription fee. Um, TomTom Tom Magazine is available for download, but also, they're, they're a lot more, more than um, other communities like Instagram accounts and websites, female drummers, female drummers account, which is very, you know, surface level, very, you know, post, post the expected looking female drummer. Um, um, I think TomTom Tom Magazine does a really good job. They're, they're really attentive to sort of diversity um, across across uh, racial lines, also along a spectrum of, um, of gender. So they, they do, and, and they're also really a grassroots community. They do a lot of local um, uh, educational and workshop sorts of things in the New York City area. 
And they're giving a voice to drummers who drummers in the New York City area and elsewhere across the United States. So this is states based. I mean, anyway, we'll take that for what it's worth. But um, <laughs> uh, so, so, but, 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 uh, but I do think it's an initiative to draw attention to, yeah. uh, because I think I think that they are they're more upfront about their political orientation than uh, than you know uh, a lot of other a lot of other media sites. I love, I love that we're, we're kind of yeah. bleeding over from our, our social media follows into mm -hmm. you know, other resources that are, are web based and is out yeah. there. Um, I'm gonna throw a couple out. Uh, one is actually um, the executive director is a colleague of mine at Arizona State, uh, Aaron Barra, who uh, actually runs the popular music degree program at Arizona State. She is the executive director of an, of a, of an organization called Beats by Girls which has several chapters throughout the US and is which is really incredible. Once again, I'll have the website down below. And then another resource to kind of take a look at once again, just to, to continue the conversation. And I just found this article yesterday um, as I was reading for some of the research that I was doing. And it's actually informal learning of popular music, gender monoglossia and heteroglossia. And it talks wow. about all these roles in the classroom and the three authors, um, I think it's Amy Butler, um, uh, 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 Kelly Bailica and Ruth Wright up in Ontario, uh, Ruth. Um, they talk about, uh, they talk about the, some of the gendered roles that they saw in, 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 in these, in, in these, in these popular music rehearsals in the classroom. And it's fascinating because as I was reading down through it, I'm like, yep, yep. That was, yep. I saw that. Yep. That's on the gig in the classroom. Um, and then oddly enough, some of what they saw contradicts or has kind of some tensions with some of the existing research that's out there. So once again, that's a really great article to check out. And once again, I'll put that down in the resources section. Um, Paul, what are you thinking? What do you have to offer today? So, Other than your kind of, brilliant commentary. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> basically, I, as you'd expect being a stuffy academic, I've gone straight for a text, but not quite. Because Kristen Lieb's book about gender branding in the modern music industry is on its second edition. Now that's got to be celebrated in and of itself. It's not a first edition, it's a second edition. And I think we need to recognize it's got history going through this. And I love the book because it's so beautifully honest about looking at MTV, which provided the screen for the male gaze. Mm. And it really makes uncomfortable reading still, which is wonderful. But just to be trying down with the kids here, when you go to Kristen Lieb's site, this is what I love about that, the way academia is moving. Not only do you have the book that you read, which is the tomb, which is peer reviewed, you actually have her thoughts in her blog post and her thoughts about the book and how it moved to that point, which gives a beautiful enrichment of this. And more and more authors are doing this. So as a, as a call out to anybody listening to this podcast, don't just think, okay, that's a good text, I can put it in chase the sources look at what people are putting in their own social media feeds on their own websites because that gets the traction and the currency that's needed to break this discussion even further absolutely what i would love to do at first is just to thank our guests to thank vincent thanks absolutely. vic and thanks margaret uh, for the conversation this morning uh, it's been enlightening um challenging and i hope the things we've discussed this morning uh, serve serve as a once again as a lifeline to some folks out there, and also once again to Ku, uh, to help us uh, continue these 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 hard conversations. So once again, really appreciate your conversation. Appreciate Absolutely. your uh, your time this morning. Now, now, Steve, is it time for my provocation yet? You ready? Here we go. Can there be equality and diversity and popular music education? if we don't have it in society. Hmm. We'd love to hear your responses to the provocation. We encourage you to join the conversation on your social media of choice using the hashtag APME Talkback. We'll use your responses as the foundation for our continuing conversation in part two of this blog. Have a topic you'd like us to consider, a question you'd be keen on us digging into, or perhaps a provocation of your own reach out to us using the hashtag APME Talkback. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening.